All right, so um, we are going to get started. It's a little past 9.30. 8.30. It feels like... 6.30 Yeah, it feels like 6.30. Um, this is our first biannual engagement meeting, so welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is our agenda, so I, I just want to introduce the purpose of these meetings, give everyone a brief study update, although I think everyone knows where we're at. Um, briefly discuss our, you know, general engagement plan. And then I really want to spend the bulk of the time talking about recruitment, recruitment and retention, and most importantly, discussion and feedback on really anything, but I do have some specific items to discuss in terms of um, protocol feasibility. The purpose of the biannual meetings is to, um, and this is as we named in our PCORI proposal, is to explore overall experiences among patients, families, and surgeons. Although we are not at this point planning on inviting patients and family members who've enrolled in the study in this meeting, we do have quarterly panels with people who have completed the intervention, and we do plan to share that information at this at these meetings in order to um, you know better understand um, the experience of people on this trial, and then we'll review study progress and really get um, feedback. We really want to get all of your feedback in terms of um, acceptability, usability, uptake uh, uh, of the intervention from stakeholders, including you, and hopefully in the future, as we get started and enroll, we'll have um, more participation from sites and their research teams. And just to introduce the team, I think um, all of many of you have met the team. So um, I'm Dan Raz. This is Virginia Sun. We are the dual PIs. Katie Duff is our program manager. I know she's online. Um, Research assistants are um, Joan, who's here with us. Hi, Joan. And Amy, who is online. And then um, our research nurse is uh, Mari Haj. And um, our PT OT interventionists are um, Vanessa and Audrina. Um, and then we have um, our wonderful patient partners, Andrea, uh, who I saw is online, Lee, who is here with us in person. Um, Judy, and I know you have to leave early, Judy, I hope your family's okay, and Maria. And then our biostatistics team, Catherine and Katie from um, Fred Hutch. These are our confirmed participating sites. We're so excited to work with all of you. And just to give an update on the status of the study, so um, we do have conditional approval um, from WCG, the central IRB that we're working on. We just have to respond to a few pretty minor conditions that um, we're working on. And um, we have completed our study database, which was um, quite uh, an undertaking, but looks really wonderful. And thank you to Aaron Seniseros, especially for helping out with that. We've um, more or less completed City of Hope research staff training. All of the site agreements for the participating sites are in process, so we have to do that through City of Hope. Um, and we have a training webinar that we've developed with really, really great input from the SWOG um, team who helps with that. Um, really great feedback and, and help with that, and that's been recorded and it's just being um, edited and finalized. So that's actually going to be sent out to sites um, in the coming days. And our anticipated timeline, we're hoping to accrue our first participant at City of Hope, hopefully sometime in November. Um, we're going to initiate site training um, soon after that. So the site training involves viewing the training webinar. Um, the sites have to provide a virtual demonstration of the six-minute walk test in the SPPB. 
and we're also going to have virtual site initiation visits that we'll schedule um, you know once all of the site agreements are completed and and sites do all of their agreements for the IRB approval and we kind of have a deadline of February 2023 for first participant accrued at 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 least one other site other than City of Hope. And um, just briefly, these are, as all of you know, PCORI has a number of milestones, many milestones, um, but it's it's also good to keep us, you know, focused and on track. So these are the upcoming milestones, including this, this meeting is a milestone, development of uh, the training webinar was a milestone that we had to um, complete by the end of this month, which we um, have just done or are in the process of putting the finishing touches on. Um, site training, um, uploading the uh, protocol, which we'll do as soon as we get our final WCG approval. Um, you know, putting it on clinicaltrials.gov, um, uploading the data safety monitoring plan, which we've already done for PCORI, so that's that's completed. Um, submitting the engagement plan, which we're, we've just, um, thank you for all of your inputs to uh, stakeholders for, for helping with that. Um, we'll circulate a, a, a more finalized version. We're just waiting to get some <laughs> feedback from um, Sabira. And then um, uh, research staff training. So. Um, at City of Hope has been completed. As I mentioned, we're going to be sending out the training webinar um, soon to the uh, remaining sites. And we're going to, we have a firm deadline of February 1st to both complete training and start recruitment. So we're going to ask sites to actually uh, watch the training video. And this is not so much for the surgeons, but more for the research staff at the sites um, to complete it by, um, by January 1st. Um, so we'll obviously um, send all of that out and instructions about that. In terms of our engagement plan, this is our kind of engagement structure. And when we talk about engagement, we're really talking about um, uh, soliciting feedback and um, input from important stakeholders throughout the process of the study from development, the startup phase, recruitment, data analysis, and dissemination. So we have our core research team, um, which I, are the people on that first slide. Um, we have our stakeholder advisory committee, which many of you um, have participated in. And we have additional stakeholders um, that I think I mentioned um, Next, but um, those include payers, healthcare maker, healthcare policy makers, which PCORI specifically called out for us to engage, um, exercise and wellness um, thought leaders, and lung cancer advocacy groups. Um, we also, once we start recruitment at other sites, we're going to have monthly um, site investigator and coordinator meetings. Uh, to provide input to us on what's working, what's not working, um, and to troubleshoot any issues um, with accrual or with the protocol. Um, we're going to have quarterly patient and family caregiver panels, both in English and Spanish, um, to hear more about the experiences um, of people who've completed the study. And those are all, um, you know, basically like focus groups um, and people have to consent to that and get compensated to participate in that. And we'll share um, results of that at these meetings um, with the larger group. And briefly to review engagement activities. So we are currently meeting weekly with our SAC, with our SAC, the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. Um, once we start accrual, we're going to meet probably every two weeks. Um, we have these biannual engagement meetings, so this is our first one. And the next one will be at the American Association for Thoracic Surgery meeting in Toronto in late April. And, um, you know, very few of the surgeons who um, are participating in the study come to these SWOG meetings. So um, these surgery meetings are really um, the best 
venues, I think, to have fruitful discussions with the surgeons who participate. And we may actually add a third um, activity, which is at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons meeting, which is late January, not this year, but maybe in the, in the coming years, um, to have a kind of a check-in time to get surgeon feedback, because it is a little hard, you know, surgeons are busy, different schedules, and it's hard to get everyone in a room together or, you know, get feedback from everybody. Do they go to ask them? Not some, but most don't. Yeah, it's really those two meetings that are very consistently attended. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna have monthly site coordinating, co coordinator meetings once we start accruing at other sites and these um, quarterly family caregiver stakeholder panels. Panels, And then one thing I didn't mention is we are going to have a study conclusion virtual seminar um, that we hope to, you know, invite a lot of other stakeholders that will be important for dissemination. Um, and obviously that's, obviously that's a little ways away. These are slides from um, Jamie Sundstrom, who unfortunately couldn't make it uh, for this meeting. Um, for this meeting right now, um, but she did provide us some slides in terms of, you know, what is available from SWOG to help with recruitment. So first of all, there's um, committee resources. We're fortunate to have um, Judy um, as part of the study. Thank you, Judy. Um, because we are recruiting Spanish-speaking patients, which may you know, I think that's one area where we really need to have a discussion on how to best um, kind of support recruitment of Spanish speaking patients because it may be maybe a little bit more challenging. Um, so we have our Hispanic uh, Latinx uh, community advocate Eileen Fuentes and um, and then the recruitment and retention advocate um, Desiree Walker. Um, who, you know, might be able to provide us with some feedback. And really, um, thank you to uh, Jamie for helping coming up with uh, um, some more detailed plan in terms of recruitment and retention. Um, SWOG provides us with accrual reports. Um, once we start accruing, although we'll be, you know, obviously monitoring and tracking our accrual um, with our, through our core team as well. Um, and then SWAG has some really great um, assistance with recruitment materials. So protocol flyers for providers and patients. Um, they can help us develop a slide deck for providers, a community outreach slide deck, um, a kind of more brief physician fact sheet and protocol cards um, to distribute. So um, that's gonna be really, I think, really valuable. Um, documents to help us um, with recruitment and retention. And um, this was, this is, you know, again, Jamie's um, slide in terms of recommendations, um, offer participation, participation to all patients, obviously if they meet eligibility criteria, um, regularly monitor accrual, which we'll be doing, communicate often, um, and I think the really key thing is learn from high accruing sites, what works, what doesn't work, and to share that information with the other sites. Um, this is our slide uh, that um, uh, we put together to um, kind of summarize our plan. So in terms of strategies for recruitment and retention, and, and this is, please feel free to um, chime in. Um, we definitely want each site who's participating to think about ways to promote the study um, and to develop a plan with the surgeons and really individual surgeons on how to identify referrals. So how to screen clinic lists, how to communicate with the surgeon, because it's gonna be different site to site, surgeon to surgeon. You know, at City of Hope, for example, for studies like this, you know, we have someone screening the clinic list and they really have to kind of go into individual patient charts and see what they're there for and what's planned. They have to kind of monitor the operating room schedule to make sure, you know, there haven't been any patients who've been missed 
And then they typically communicate with the surgeons to say, hey, you know, who are the potentials? Can you, you know, kind of to remind them and put them, put that on their radar. And, and every surgeon at our site prefers a little bit of a different style of communication. Some people, you know, don't want to be called. Some people do. So um, I think it's important to have those conversations. Do you have an, a, an IRB approval where the site coordinator, whoever that person is, can, in EPIC, see a list of patient names, email the, um, the surgeon to get consent to contact the patient? Yeah, I don't think we have that like called out in the IRB approval, but that's typically what we do. Yeah, so that's yeah. how we recruit yeah. at Yale, so I'm hoping to be the first site yes. to crew. Um, and it works, it's very proactive, yes. so we're not waiting for the surgeon to then contact someone else. This, exactly. So exactly. it's, it, and, and given your timing here, um, it's important to sort of have each site be proactive, but it sounds like it's nice that you have flexibility. Each site can do it a little bit differently. Yeah, I think I think flexibility is important because the workflow is different at each site. But I agree, it needs to be proactive, and this is the discussion we have to be having now with each site, how to you know developing a strategy to do that. One thing that I could foresee happening with a study like this is, you know, at each individual site, there's typically a number of surgeons, some are smaller groups, two people, others groups are larger groups. Um, but, you know, I think one thing that could happen in a site like this is the, the surgeon who's the site PI is the one enrolling patients and none of the other partners, you know, are engaged right. in enrolling patients, et cetera, or, or maybe very few. So I think it's important for the surgeons also to, you know, make sure to regularly remind other providers and kind of monitor a, to some extent you know what's happening with the cruel with the other can you partners. remind us of the timeline from someone being diagnosed and how much time there is from then to the to the 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 enrollment to then surgery not the, yeah. the typical timeline so they have to be at least 14 calendar days before their scheduled surgery and there needs to be a, a plan for surgery. Like there has to be orders at least. But from put diagnosis in. to that, for like how much? That's time? variable. So that's the thing. You know, for example, at City of Hope, if I see a patient in clinic and I schedule them for surgery, they are getting scheduled about six weeks from now. But there may be sites that have a much less impacted operating room schedule where they're seeing, you know, booking a case in two to three weeks. So, you know, we, we ask for a minimum of two weeks from the time of planned surgery so that we have sufficient time for all of the baseline evaluations and that first um, coaching call, which happens if they're assigned to the intervention group, um, that first coaching call that occurs pre-op. And then at, like, do all the thoracic surgeons at Sea of Hope and elsewhere often have, like, a tumor board meeting or a weekly meeting where you're all meeting to discuss cases? Because that could be a place, too. Yeah, like, so at City of Hope, we don't, like, at tumor board, we don't discuss upcoming okay. cases or surgeries. Like, we don't, we don't have that. We don't, we have an educational conference where, you know, certain people can be presented, you know, certain cases but um that are upcoming but it's not like we go through everything so I, and i know some sites do that some sites do meet a tumor board and go over every single lung cancer patient um okay. so yeah i think it's really individualized for the site if i may this is virginia son um so this will be a great opportunity for us to learn how to do trials like this because i know just through palliative end of life committee there are many concepts that are going to be in the similar kind of um, eligibility criteria and design where we want to enroll participants before they have their surgery. And so um, I think, and we have lots of experience at City of Hope. We just completed an R01 separate outside of the SWAG with 200 dyads. And this was a trial that absolutely needed dyads because we wanted to study the interrelationship between patients and, and family caregiver support person outcome. 
And so in our experience, the best approach is, have a, is being able to have a very good communication system with, with the surgeons and the surgical team, whether there are NPs, APPs that work with the surgeons as well, and be able to identify potentials as soon as they sign on the dotted line in terms of agreeing to having the surgery um, as part of their treatment. Now things also change, you know, surgeries get scheduled and then for various different reasons, they get they get canceled as well. And so um, we are probably likely going to see that as well. But those generally in our experience are just counted as late and eligibles mm -hmm. because that happens. Yes. Oh, um, sorry. We have actually several <laughs> attendees online, so we'd love for you to um, share your question on mic. Thank you. Thank you. At City of Hope, do you happen to have a coordinator that pre-screens every that pre-screens all the, the that they then chooses and then has all the paperwork ready for the surgeon to sign them up for? Yeah. So we have our research assistant, so Joan, for example, and Amy, who's online. Um, you know, for other studies, as I mentioned, they will pre-screen clinics of thoracic surgeons, identify potential potentially eligible patients with. With our patients, and I'm sure every other site, people are coming to us at a variety of steps before they're ready for surgery. So sometimes people come, as we call them, packaged, where they have all of the testing that they need, you know, PET scan, brain MRI, um, you know, uh, pulmonary function testing. And then, you know, some patients will need mediastinal staging. Some people come in and they don't have anything. They don't even have a biopsy. So, and then things get done like behind the scenes. So there are people who are, you know, clearly like, yes, this person is eligible. And then there are people who need a lot more evaluation who may not even be seen in person again until right before their surgery. Right, so then are those uh, people that you're talking about, are they called uh, research navigators? Or, or are they, are they, because I know you have patient navigators that are required and the, and that is one way because you have RN patient navigators that are already required. You could train your patient navigators to say looking for thoracic surgery if they meet this requirement. That's one option we have. Um, I wasn't sure if you had that as an option or you have specifically a, a team because I know our, the, the, the situation where I'm looking at um, I probably would request that the patient navigator for lung cancer be notified so that way they could facilitate enrolling and it'll be seamless. Yeah, I think each site will probably have their own process depending on what resources they have available. At, you know, for example, at our site, we have two full time CRAs for this project. So they are trained to, you know, go through and screen, but you know, definitely if at another site, if the research assistant who's involved in the study needs help, you know, they don't have the time to, to do that, then, you know, we have to figure out a workflow to do that. Thank you. One other comment I just wanted to make also, something that I cannot stress enough is the importance of the surgeon introducing the study. And it does not have to be, you know, an hour long discussion. It can literally be a 10 second, like there's the study that I think you should really listen to and someone's going to talk to you. It's about physical activity. I mean, even that is better than nothing. I can't tell you enough, like for, it's one thing if it's like a drug trial where the oncologist perhaps is, you know, going into it in depth and the patient is, you know, this is their treatment for studies that are, you know, still interventional, but perhaps not kind of directly, um, yeah, more supportive. I think that surgeon input is really important because, for example, at our site, there are several research assistants waiting to talk to every patient about a variety of different potential projects. And it's very, can be very overwhelming. So I think having the surgeon kind of prompt the patient and, and we, have a, like a script that we create for surgeons that they don't need to read off of, but just so that they can, in the beginning, kind of have a have a plan of what to say um, is very helpful. Yes, um, Barbara Segarra, thank you for having me in your slide. Um, I'm also the incoming co-chair for the patient advocate, so you can reach out through Leah and Yuri. You have been in great hands. Um, but 
And I'm sorry, I'm a little late and don't, don't know a lot, a lot about the study, but um, part of a talk I did a couple of days ago is called Timing is Everything, right? And um, when you're diagnosed, your mind is just, I want the cancer out, right? So um, my question is, is, is this the first time that they're gonna see the surgeon and what is gonna be the approach? Because that surgery and then I'm only, a, a breast cancer survivor, so I cannot imagine what the thoracic cancer patients go through, but um, it's a lot to digest. So my recommendation will be like, I, if they have to come to a second time, that will be better if you have the six weeks or something, uh, or four weeks to do that, because it's go there's gonna be a lot of resistance because that first uh, appointment is just, you know, what is it gonna happen to me? So I don't have a mind for, and it happened to me when I had a, a, a sort of breast surgeon. I didn't like him at all, and then somebody came to ask for me, do you wanna participate in a clinical trial? I said, oh no, not you and not your doctor, right? Mm -hmm. So just to be careful about that, and again, we're more than willing if you need to talk to the whole patient, uh, uh, group, group of patient advocates, you can uh, truly let us know and we'll help you. Yeah, that's a really excellent point, and I completely agree. It's um, it's a very overwhelming. There's a lot of information, and but also our patients, like I said, they could be seen once before surgery, and that's it. And sometimes it's more than once. So it really, you know, it really depends. Have you have you thought? I'm I'm Dr. Go. I'm in general internal medicine. At, um, I know I'm probably Chris Belton, but I'm in a great. But the question I had for you is: Have you thought of doing do your Patients need perioperative evaluation. That would be a second t second touch point where you could introduce it, um, and because you, you met the surgeon already, and then you might have heard something, and then you I, I'm not I don't know how much of this how much are going to for perioperative evaluation, but then you would have that second point, especially for those who only meet the surgeon once, and then that's still a physician. Supporting. Yeah. We, so, no, that's a great point. We do have a pre anesthesia clinic, is what we call it here. So, all of our patients have to go there. And in prior surgical studies, that's oftentimes when, you know, the research assistant has met them to actually sign consent and do some of the baseline assessments, because there are a number of baseline assessments that need to be completed even before the patient is randomized. So, there is a little bit of a time crunch to get all of that done. Um, Two quick questions. I am sorry I'm not up to date with lung cancer, but is there like neoadjuvant chemo often? There is definitely neoadjuvant chemo. So then that might be a population that you might recruit from a lot because of that overwhelmed time period yeah. at diagnosis, and now they would have had a couple months. And you know, so is it, is it more common to have neoadjuvant chemo than adjuvant? Um. <laughs> I'm laughing, I, I'm making that comment because in academic centers, probably more common, but otherwise, no. So okay. there is a lot of variability. Because I bet you're going to have at the academic centers a bunch that are recruited who have had neoadjuvant chemo, which is good because there's time to sort of yeah. um, process the, you know, the patient processing their diagnosis. Right. And be, and, and then wanting to be like, I want to do more beyond. Um, and then is there a short study name, like acronym or um, of your study? Just the SR2204. Yeah, you might want to just. We'd be happy to hear any thoughts yeah. and acronyms. <laughs> just be, also I had, from I a had patient actually, perspective, they might be like, I'm when, enrolling in SR2204. When we were not sure if we could do this through SWOG, I did come up with an acronym. So we, we, oh. can, we well, can talk about it later. Okay. It was PATIO, like P-A-T-I-O, like pre-op. Perioperative, physical activity, telephone. I don't remember. I have to. I wrote yeah. it down somewhere. Something about telephone yeah. intervention in older adults. I like patio. And, and <laughs> Yeah. Like yeah. Like we can talk about it. Yeah, we can talk about. It. And, and just, I just want to. Don't want to miss some of the comments from attendees on Zoom. Many of our. Um, our patient partners and family caregiver partners are on the call. So they, you know, they have mentioned agree. Patients will be more likely to agree if it is introduced by the physician. Um, 
And Judy mentioned agreeing with Barbara, perhaps providing information on the study more than once, just in case the patients are too stressed out. And, and we know in, in reality, informed consent should be multiple. You know, it, we don't expect and shouldn't expect participants to, or in a way, coerce them, you know, to sign, right? So in our experience, it, it does take multiple conversations, give them the time to think and to digest, because oftentimes it's a lot of information. Um, to, to provide, especially in a randomized trial, because we want to be very clear in terms of what we are asking them to participate in um, based on the arms, the two arms. And um, Andrea Barandi Kitts, our, um, another one of our partners, yes, introducing it more than once is good. Definitely do it the first time too, maybe just like an initial introduction, but without saying, do you want to sign on right now? Yeah, so um, it's absolutely agree. And then, um, I, I wonder if we can maybe pause a second because we have some really good conversations happening on Zoom and maybe we can just quickly ask everyone to introduce themselves and then also ask, because we do have several attendees now. And um, Dr. Gabriela Mora, and, and I'll have you say something. I think I, I do remember you from interactions in the Latin America um, study with um, participation in S1316. So there was a question about whether we are planning to include Latin America sites. We're happy to have further discussions. And so um, so maybe we just quickly introduce ourselves and then we can ask people on the call to introduce sure. and then we can really have a nice collective conversation. And we'd love to know um, everyone that's participating online too, so. Sure, did you wanna have everyone just maybe pass around the mic sure. briefly and. Good morning, I'm Melinda Irwin and I'm um, the uh, SWOG Survivorship Committee co-chair with Hallie Moore. And I'm also at Yale University. Good morning, I'm Lee Jones. I'm the research advocate with the survivorship committee and a patient partner on the study. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Go. I'm not sure why I'm here, but I was drafted to sit here. So hi to everybody online. Um, I have a practice of pro bono practice in Belton, size of 18,000 people in Texas. And um, I get my malpractice to Texas Medical Association Liability and Trust. And um, I'm the uh, underinsured, I only see uninsured people at a food pantry. Um, and uh, and I, I've been assigned here to learn more about surgical clinical trials and how to implement them. <laughs> Thank you. And I am a, I'm an adjunct at Baylor University. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Conley. I'm a clinical research nurse at a community site, Bon Secours uh, St. Francis Cancer Center um, in the Greenville area, South Carolina. Like mentioned a while ago, Barbara Segarra Vasquez. Uh, I'm a patient advocate, two-time breast cancer survivor, and I'm the co-chair. Also a Latina, so I'm happy you're gonna have this in Spanish. And I think uh, through Elena and myself, we can help you because the approach could be different, but you're gonna see the commitment is gonna be big, right? Because Latinos, once they commit, it's gonna be, uh, they stay in the study, so. And I, I'm sorry I have to run to another meeting, but Lee will fill me in and feel free to write or communicate with me. Thank you. Sorry, I'm Erin, I'm a Merck MSL. I think I'm allowed to be in here. It didn't say yes, closed, so allowed. I hope it's okay. <laughs> All right, so um, maybe we can start with our attendees on Zoom. Judy, would you mind starting, please? No, that's fine, thanks. Judy Johnson, I am SWOG's lung cancer patient advocate and a member of the patient partners for this particular study and a breast cancer survivor. And I lost my dad to lung cancer. Thank you, Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Brandi Kitts. I'm a retired aerospace engineer turned uh, patient advocate after losing my husband to lung cancer in 2013. And uh, I'm a patient partner on uh, this study. Thank you, Katie. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hi, I'm Katie. I am the project manager for this trial at City of Hope. Thank you, Amy. 
Hi, I'm Amy. I am the Spanish speaking clinical research associate for this um, trial. Thank you. And um, oops. And I'm just going to go go down the 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 um the pictures here. So I know we have um, Danny Wang. Do you mind introducing yourself, please? Hi, uh, I'm a thoracic surgery research fellow at uh, the Mass General um, here on behalf of uh, Dr. Yang. Thank you so much for attending. We appreciate it very much. Of course, very excited. And then Dr. Mora. Good morning to everybody. I'm uh, Gabriela Mora. I work in, in Mexico at the NCI Institute. Uh, as head, uh, CRA. Thank you so much for attending. It's great to reconnect. I, I remember interacting with you from S1316 and we will definitely, you know, love to see if there are um, opportunities to open this in Latin America. Excellent news for us. Thank you. Um, Thank you everyone for attending. Um, I did want to also just to get back to recruitment and retention also call out um, Spanish speaking participant enrollment and also for each site to think about strategies to um, to help foster that. So, you know, one thing that we were proposing is that, um, you know, we think each site about accrual goals of Spanish speaking participants just to get started thinking about, well, how many people do we see? Um, Cause you know, lung cancer is a little bit less common in um, uh, Latino and Latinas. Um, but I think it's important to start thinking about, you know, individual site strategies just to effectively engage Spanish speaking participants. Um, and then in terms of materials that we kind of recommend. So first, we do have a patient flyer, which I believe is on one of the next slides. Um, I may have left it out, actually. Um, but we do have a patient flyer that's been IRB approved, both in English and Spanish, that'll be available to all the different sites to have in their waiting rooms, um, or in, you know, to distribute to, to potential uh, participants. Um, Definitely, we encourage social media campaigns working with your marketing teams at your individual sites to promote the study if that's an option at your site um, in English and Spanish. And then, um, you know, healthcare provider flyers may be useful um, to engage surgeons or, you know, other, you know, other team members, oncologists, pulmonologists. Um, so that they kind of are in the loop about the study. Um, before I move on to just kind of general discussion, um, is there any other comment about the prior slide or materials? Um, so I wanted to use the remaining time to really to have open discussion. Um, I do have um, two main um, points that I wanted to make sure to discuss. One is um, something we've already talked a little bit about, which is identification of eligible participants at sites. And so maybe we've already discussed that. Um, if there's other comments, please bring them up. And then just so you, just to preview. So the other one that I really wanted to discuss, and I think this is more for the surgeons, and I did have kind of email discussions with, I think almost all of the surgeons responded um, in terms of feasibility of the time points. So maybe we can start with that. So, you know, this study, just to refresh your memory, um, involves for both, both arms uh, undergo assessments of both patients and family caregivers at baseline, which is a pre-op time point, at discharge, and that's just the patients. And so discharge is while they're in the hospital, that shouldn't be an issue. But then most importantly, days 30, 60, and 180 days post-op. And those assessments for the patient have to do, have to be in person because they are, do involve six minute walk test, um, the SPPB, and a number of surveys. A survey is obviously can, complete, can be completed online, 
um, but those assessments have to be in person. And the 30-day post-op assessment is our primary outcome. So it's very, very important that we, you know, have, um, have that complete. There's a lot of variability in when surgeons see their patients as like the standard of care. So most surgeons, because I asked all the surgeons who are participating, see the patient back one to two weeks after surgery, not 30 days. So either the participant has to make a separate visit for those assessments, or there could be the option of pushing out that initial post-op visit to a longer period of time. And obviously we don't want to ask sites to do any to really like deviate from their clinical practice. But for example, me personally, I don't see a problem seeing the patient back, you know, closer to four weeks than two weeks. In fact, when I was in training, um, there were some surgeons who felt like the one to two week time point was way too soon, that that was not a great time because people were still uncomfortable, still dealing with, you know, pain and um, having a discussion on the next steps was more fruitful at a later time. Um, I, I could see it either way. I think it also just depends on the individual patient. Like if there's someone I'm a little bit concerned about, then maybe waiting to closer to a month is not a great idea. But for the most part, I think me personally, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Hey, hey, Dan, could I interrupt for just a second? Please. Um, from a patient perspective, it's not only your concern about the patient, but some of the patients might actually feel more comfortable coming in twice so that they get that early on follow up when, you know, you know, some might not, but you might want to also ask the patient their preference. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I think it also, you know, one other thing that like we do, for example, and it's not on every patient to be honest, but I usually will ask my nurse practitioners to check in with the patient the week after surgery by telephone and make, and, and see how they're doing. So in every patient that I'm a little bit, you know, maybe someone who's more frail, you know, I do ask that for them to, to do that. And I think that is somewhat common for um, APPs who are involved in the team to reach out to patients to see how they're doing because a lot of times our experience is that people have pain and they, for whatever reason, do not call, do not, you know, communicate that there's, there's a problem. And so checking in on patients can be very helpful because most of those things you can troubleshoot over the telephone. Um, I'm a little bit worried that there's a bleeding of the research with the clinical care, I think at certain sites that they just want clinical care to go as is. Yeah. So if they normally come one week post-op, I don't think they're gonna wanna switch how they normally do practice to accommodate um, a research study. Yeah. But when is the next visit after that often? Usually like at our, at our site, it's almost always six months. Okay, so I think then you're gonna plan for scheduling a separate visit not tied with clinical care yeah. I would just make that the expectation. Right. And if it happens to align with a site that has a one month, you know, that's when they normally see a patient, then great. But I right. wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, I, I think you're almost going to have thoracic surgeons in the team pull back and participating if, if, if the team is telling them you have to change the way you normally see patients. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think the way I framed it with the surgeons was, you know, what do you feel comfortable with? Um, because I personally would rather, and, and there is a plus or minus seven day window. So I don't see patients back at one week unless there's something specific that I'm having to come back for a lab test or an x-ray or something. For me, it's, it's minimum of two weeks and it's sometimes three weeks. So for me, you know, an extra week is not like, I don't think there's that much yeah. difference, um, but I agree. I don't want people changing their practice for the study, but I do think it's an option. Like, especially if a patient is, you know, a lot of people, even when they don't live super far away, you know, they're older, they had surgery, they don't really want to come in. Um, and then to have them come in twice, 
you know, in a relatively short period of time, for some people, it may be an issue. Can you remind us again two things? What is, it, regardless of your study, is are there tests done such as a, 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 a stand up and go or a, a short walking test that you usually perform with your patients post surgery or no? Is it just no, talking? Okay. It's just talking. And then um, remind us when the counseling calls are timed with these um, follow up visits. Yes, good. So, like when is the last call? Day 51 after surgery, so post discharge. So that's about 60 day. Yeah, it's close okay. to that. So that one, it will be so critical. So I think if if sites, you're going to have incomplete, you're, you're going to have lost, not yeah. lost to follow, but missed sessions. Right. But I think if you tell sites to put all of their effort in trying to get that 60 day post-op, because that's where you are going to see the largest effect perhaps on the six minute walk test. Yeah. I mean, any, any yeah. you, know, you can do a mixed modeling statistical analysis. So sure. any and all data is critical. Yeah. But put all of your energy into that sixty day visit. I mean, the thirty day visit is our primary outcome, and oh. we and we chose the thirty day because you know when you look at kind of the trajectory of physical function after surgery. Yeah. Well, it's going to be the very lowest, like at right after the surgery, like at the discharge evaluation, and then. I think, you know, my impression looking at the data and just my own personal experience is that, you know, by day 60, most people are, and I don't see patients at day 60, so that's the other thing. I don't know. Like, we see patients two weeks and then six months later. But my, again, my impression is that there's a lot of variability in how quickly people bounce back and that at day 30, we might see more differences. Yes. So then I, yes, then sorry, then totally push yeah. for 30 and 60. But <laughs> yeah. if a site only has that two week post op visit, get yeah. it then, because yeah. the likelihood of getting them back in at day 30 might be low. So just yeah. and at any window that they come in post surgery, I would have, have the site. Just get do it, it done. Yeah. So that was, a, that's the other thing that we briefly discussed was making that window of plus or minus seven days longer. And, you know, obviously we want feasibility. We, we want the data. We don't want, we'd rather there be an earlier time point than no data, but there is a lot of, there are a lot of changes that happen over that time point in the first 30 days. And so a patient who's two weeks out compared to four weeks out, you know, in that individual patient, there may be a lot of difference. What, do you, what are your thoughts about that, Virginia? Do you, know, do you, do you understand what I'm, I, I the guess, point that I'm making? Yeah, I guess I'm, so do we anticipate, so you are saying that there, um, that we are potentially gonna see a big difference between that seven to 14 days, like two weeks, one or two weeks post-op, yeah. and then at day 30. But, but the understanding is that perhaps the majority of thoracic surgeons actually do see them earlier. Correct. So, so one of the things I, and, and I, I don't think there would be to, I don't think changing it perhaps to, for example, the first post-op visit, which is typically one to two weeks post-op mm -hmm. versus 30 days. I don't know, Melinda, if you have any what, thoughts. What are your intervention sessions again? Yeah, the interventions, that, that's a great point. Um, we have intervention sessions five. The first one starts before surgery. The second one is around the time they're discharged from the hospital. And we have three booster sessions. Do you have the study? The I don't one? have this. Uh, I don't, I don't <laughs> think I have the schema, but it's seven, to... seven, 14, 21, and then 51 days are yeah. the last, are the last four. Seven, yeah. 14, you said 14. 21 and 51 post-op, not uh, post-discharge, sorry. Post-discharge, like, yeah. Not, you know, post-op. So if they were in the hospital for two weeks, it's you know, it's still. Um... Yeah, I mean, randomization will take care of some of the differences in the in the timing of these mm. visits mm -hmm. and sample size. True. Yeah. True. Yeah. I, I had okay. So I just want to show you your, your post op day is seven twenty one thirty. Oh, the assessment. So, the yeah. the coaching calls, the are telephone co coaching calls are yeah. the first one is pre surgery and then. Um, day seven after discharge, okay. 
I, <laughs> I'm sorry to have, what's that? 21. 21. I know there's a 51, but I feel like we're missing one somewhere like in there. In the they don't get a code to the, uh, so there's assessments and then there's, there's the, the, yeah, so the assessments. So there's are, no coaching in the, in the pre-discharge. There is the data collection that, that we do, but um, so it's the support before surgery and then shortly after they return home. It's more frequent. I think it's, it's seven days, like, like almost weekly um, for the first two weeks and then it spreads out a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, okay. So, okay. So you're doing, okay. So your interventions are weekly, um, day, day one post a uh, post discharge day one or day two, and then post discharge day two and two works after that. And then you want to follow up to see how they're doing is what the 30 day, 60 day and 180 day to see if it made a difference. Yeah. Those are so, assessments. Yeah. yeah. So those are your assessments. Have yeah. you thought about timing? Cause have you thought about timing your, their assessments? Don't they see the oncologist for anything else or, 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 or their primary care physician for anything else? Well, the, so they, they don't always see an oncologist. Okay. Um, I would say from early stage patients, unless they've received neoadjuvant therapy, so they're kind of a little stage two or three, or they need to have adjuvant therapy, most of the like stage one patients do not see an oncologist. So, you know, the mix is probably going to be like our institution is probably, I don't know, a majority stage one, but not a okay. big majority, like probably 40, 30, 40% yeah. of people are getting some, you know, neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy. Okay. And then um, are they going to, they, they're stage one. So they came in, you've been got some neoadjuvant therapy, you see them, they go ahead and get it cut out, which is wonderful. Then they're going to have their intervention. And then you're in the post-op global area for 180 days. So mm -hmm. then they're there, they're yours. Then do they, um, so so if they're not going to be, the reason why I'm just breaking this up is if there's, they're not having any other follow-ups in their stage one, then coming in for 30 days is actually not as big of a deal. If, yeah. if, if, they're, if, you, if you're saying that, okay, they're stage four and they've got so many blood draws and they've got so many, you know, right. then it becomes a, a bigger, a bigger yeah. issue of transportation. Yeah, so, no, I agree with you. I think it's just individual for the patient, like a lot of our patients come from far away yeah, at so our institution, and it's probably similar at other institutions. So for some people, that's no big deal. And for other people, it is a big deal. Exactly. So, so the question then comes in, and for those who have a transportation issue, mm -hmm. are you giving gas cards? Yes, we have remuneration, and we can we can provide that, that goes towards, and, and they are typically um, timed with follow-up assessments. So, um, so every time they complete a follow-up assessment, we do provide some, some compensation. Do you think it would be enough to, to even to compensate for the whole distance or just part of the distance? It really depends on what that distance is. Right, but collectively, <laughs> it's, it's definitely over $100 um, across all the different follow-up time points. For we just give, them to, give it to them, you know, kind of spread it out. Because, yeah. Because if you're concerned, because it sounds like if you're concerned for the people who have the farthest to go, like rural Felton, okay, then I will tell you that the, it, the easiest way is to make sure you compensate the whole distance. That would be the, one of the easiest ways, and that's the discussion in Texas right now, mm -hmm. is to do that. The other option you have is to do a telemedicine visit and, do, and have them walk. Well, what, can we, sorry, can we have you? Sorry. That's okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we appreciate it, yeah. Thank you. I would love to have the Zoom community let me know if this is what their opinion is, because um, we, this is the biggest problem we're having in Texas, actually, is the, is going back and forth. And so right now, I guess that's why I was drafted to be here. OK, so um, so first thing I usually do is I count how many visits are going to be going. OK, if it's if it's going to be a lot, then I time it with a visit. If they're not going to have a visit, then usually it's not that Make of a deal because like the patient advocates have told us they'd like to see you. They'd like to see you. Okay. They want to see you. The second thing, what I also I was educated from my Belton patients, especially if they have to go to MD Anderson or they have to go to Baylor Scott and White. What they like to know is that if you do give them reimbursement, they like you to cover the full amount. So 
that that so you would, I don't know how many people you would do with the sites. I don't know how they can tag it. I know that um, we're trying to adjust for that in Texas because we have a lot of people who have to drive an hour to two hours to go ahead and sit for a clinical trial. The third thing that we are we are, and I don't know if you want to add it because it may change, but there has been a push to do the assessments telemedicine, and to have them do the walking and have them wear. My patients wear a Samsung watch. I don't know why they don't do Apple because it's too expensive, but they do some kind of digital walking where you can actually monitor and get and get their vital signs through that digital watch. Now that might be adding too much bag of worms. I, I don't know. City Hope, I, I had assumed that most of your patients are urban, but you're right, all the sites. But I, when I look at your sites, a lot of them are urban, maybe M, except MD Anderson gets calls from a bigger area in Texas. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so just to address a few of those points. So all of the participants, both in the physical activity coaching and the usual care arm, do receive pedometers. So we are monitoring steps. However, um, we had a discussion about kind of doing a virtual six minute walk test. And unfortunately, that's not really been um, validated. And it's, it's, it's actually complex because people are using apps and, you know, it's, it's not straightforward to do. Hopefully, you know, one nice thing that might come out of the study, we're going to have so much data on steps and six minute walk tests. I'm really looking forward to see if we can, you know, show kind of maybe that some kind of daily step is, you know, a surrogate marker, for example, for six minute walk tests or something. I think we'll, we'll be able to contribute to the field, you know, in that, um, with that perspective. Oh, thank you. I'll just go closer and and, and I'll bring my computer up here so that you don't have to run back and forth. I feel so sad. Okay, um, so then, then if that's the case, if, if if that's the case, then 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 my my advice for the people who have to travel back and forth, or you're worried about they're not coming of the travel, is just try your best to give them the most amount of money to cover for yeah. the long distance. Yeah. And that would that would just that because in Texas that seems to be what gets them there. And yeah. so you're stage no, this, one. This is a very important issue. We don't have that much time left. Um, we're we're like one or two minutes left. It's great. Um, discussion though yeah. thank you so much I, real quickly i think we have a study that's um mm -hmm. uh in ovarian cancer patients who tend to be a little bit older similar um to yours but i think what has worked for us is at the very beginning after they've consented and they've been enrolled um prior to randomization i guess you would literally schedule all of these dates and times so that the team has it, the patient has it, the caregiver has it, and they're less likely to then not show up, right? And then I agree wholeheartedly that because the primary endpoint is six minute walk test, it does have to be in person. Yeah. And that's the primary. That is um, the primary endpoint. But that's the primary reason too that they're coming for the clinic. There's nothing right. else because the surveys can all be done online. Correct. Right? So it's not. A, it shouldn't be a long visit. Right. Should be a brief visit. And um, what'll be really interesting to your point is there could be people who can't walk but 30 seconds and others who can finish a six minute walk test. Mm -hmm. And so every step is going to matter. I mean, the difference could be very large mm -hmm. between in, uh, the two randomization <coughs> groups, but often studies show about a four, I think studies not in this set and not in this cancer patient population have like a 40 step difference between the groups yeah. so every step will matter that's why the in-person is critical yeah. Yeah. but i think scheduling those so just visits. a couple a couple of points i want to make because i know we're out of time and i do want to just make sure we get any additional feedback from the people on the zoom so first of all the only logistical issue with scheduling everything up front is all of these are post discharge dates so without knowing when the patient is discharged, because some people stay one day, some people stay one week, and we don't want to. So maybe on the day or day prior to discharge. Yes, we can schedule everything. Yes. Correct. So that's our plan: is to kind of just schedule everything, and then you know there can be adjustments. And then the last thing I wanted to just make last point because we did discuss a little bit about this issue of helping people with transportation. I don't think we can feasibly give different participants different amount of money. However, I would say that the sites are getting, you are all getting some startup funds. There is money per participant. 
and the amount of money that it costs to provide you know some additional if it's feasible at the site some additional help with transportation is not very large um, and and that's something for individual sites to consider you know if that is something that they can do um, so i think that's something that we're going to leave up to the individual sites to determine if they can you know help in some way with transportation for research So then I would encourage individual sites to actually push back on your uh, pharma corporate grants. Um, the, in Texas, that is what that that is what I was educated that there is possibility in Texas that you could push back like on Genentech to write a corporate grant saying I'm going to do the study. I have some money, but I don't have enough. And then you could push back to, to make a travel fund. That's the feedback we're hearing from Texas. That site should have a travel fund just for people on clinical trials. Is there, is there any other, because we're out of time, um, from the people who are on Zoom, I want to make sure to get your feedback if you're OK staying a, a few more minutes. Any feedback, any of the Zoomers? All right, well then, um, we're really out of time. I so appreciate it. this is a great discussion and um, we look forward to working with you all and um, hopefully once we start accruing, we can um, have some more participation from the sites and give them give us their feedback and experience on the study. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.